Uh, thank you for inviting me. Yes, I'm from the Open Spaces Society, but I am involved in a number of organisations. I do a lot of work on paths, but I'm going to talk to you more about land, and in particular, common land, which is something that's very special to the Open Spaces Society, which indeed was founded 157 years ago, in 1865, um, as the Commons Preservation Society. We are Britain's oldest national conservation body. Um, so we talk about common land and immediately people um, wonder what we really mean like, by that. And they probably think we mean land that is commonly owned. Um, in fact, it is land which has an owner. All land in England and Wales has an owner, even if we don't know who that person or body is. And common land is no different. But what is special about commons is that other people have rights on them. Um, and they might have rights of, of collecting wood um, or gathering bracken um, for their holdings. So they go right back to medieval times. They are very wide ranging in their, where they are and their habitats. So here we've got a photograph of Pumlumman in central Wales, a great open moorland. That is a common. Then there's a common near my home in the Chilterns, a little piece of land close to the houses. Um, and so the rights on these commons would, would vary according to the nature of the common. So here we are um, gathering bracken some time ago um, on Chaley Common in East Sussex um, and people would gather that bracken for their holdings um, to perhaps to stuff in their roofs to prevent the rain getting in. It was all about your personal um, requirements. You couldn't buy and sell uh, these products from the common but they were to enable survival. So they were to enable the peasants really to survive. And then we had the enclosure movement when a lot of land was grabbed by parliamentary acts which allowed the landowners to take the land away they were meant to leave some of the common for the commoners uh, very few of them did so we've lost a lot of commons but commons they still do survive so there's something like one and a half million acres i'm sorry i'm i'm old money not uh, hectares one and a half million acres in england and wales um some of them very big some of them very small um and they are very historic. Now, Jack talked about the historic paths and the history of our landscape is written in our paths. It's also written in our commons. Um, and it's very important that people should remember where the boundaries are and should cherish them. And here we have a bunch of people in, in Cheshire doing beating the bounds. Uh, and this used to happen a lot to remind people um, of where the boundaries of these special places are. So I'm going to move on to the Open Spaces Society, founded 1865, just at the end of that enclosure movement uh, the mid-Victorian enclosure movement and at the time when people were beginning really to get outdoors and to cherish the open spaces close to them for recreation but those open spaces were perhaps not under threat from the enclosure movement anymore but were under threat from development and that's where our society came in and our legal advisors helped to advise um, on the commons and here's Hampstead Heath in London which is one a very early victory for the society we worked with local people and commoners to save that from gravel extraction. Um, and we saved Wimbledon a Common, Epping Forest, and many others by championing the commoners' rights there. Um, we helped to secure the Metropolitan Commons Act of 1866, which prevented the enclosure of commons within the Metropolitan Police District, which is an area of about three miles radius from Charing Cross. Um, so that was very significant for people. And that was the first act really that recognized the importance of keeping commons unenclosed. So the society was founded. Here's Lord Eversley, who was a minister in Gladstone's government. He was our um, founder. Um, and interestingly, we had a number of very establishment people founding us. I like to think we're radical, but we're not at all because we were founded by, you know, people like um, the Duke of Westminster was at one of our early meetings. I mean, you know, um, <laughs> Charles Dilk, Octavia Hill. These are names that, that are quite, Robert Hunter. Um, and uh, others like W.H. Smith, you know, famous for a store, but actually he was um, a, a big landowner. Um, oh, and here's William Morris. I love this. William Morris, um, who was also one of our early people. So this unlikely band of campaigners got together and really talked about um, campaigning for people's common rights. These rights, um, pers rights for their um, own purposes. We're not talking about public rights at the moment. They are common rights, but they... By protecting the common rights, they were able to protect the land for the people. And of course, in doing this, there was a lot of local opposition because there were the developers who wanted to grab the land. Um, and there were some colourful battles. Um, I'm having to go very fast through this, but I must just pause. Berkhamstead Common, 1866, Lord Brownlow, the owner, fenced it off. Now, it so happened that Augustus Smith, who was one of our people, 
um, had rights there. And so he decided to use the old law of abatement, whereby a commoner can go out and pull down a fence. Um, but he didn't do it himself. He got onto the society who hired a trainload of very tough men who went out in the middle of the night from Euston to Tring Station, marched three miles to the common and pulled down the fencing before the sun rose. And um, the result of that was, well, I have to tell you that the, the um, men were led, there was meant to be a sort of solicitor with them looking after them. Um, but unfortunately he drank too much at Euston Station and was in no fit state to leave them. But luckily the, the men themselves didn't drink so much that they couldn't do the job. Anyway, by the morning, the fences had gone. Lord Brownlow was pretty horrified. A number of court cases ensued, but basically the common has remained unenclosed and it's now owned by the National Trust. So, you know, we claim that as another of our, our victories. I mentioned the National Trust. In 1895, the society recognised that what it was doing was great, but it wasn't good enough. You need to own land to be able to protect it. Um, and we know, you know, the power of landowners, don't we? So, so they then formed the National Trust. Robert Hunter, who was one of ours before he was with the Trust, formed the National Trust along with Octavia Hill and Canon Rawnsley. So we are the founders and we like to remind the Trust of that. So if they put up fencing on a common or block a path, we say, hmm, you know, we are your parent and uh, we tick them off. But we also helped the Trust to acquire properties. Hang on, I've got to think, there we go, okay. Um, this is Marcop um, Castle on the borders of Staffordshire, and we managed to buy that and then give it to the Trust. And there were countless properties where we were able to do that. So we were really working with the Trust, um, helping the Trust to, to get its portfolio of, of places. Um, and it was about 1899, shortly after that, that we got involved in Rights of Way. And interestingly, Octavia Hill, one of the Trust founders, was the catalyst for that. She talked about the little winding byways that are being forgotten and blocked up. And so we did get into Rights of Way, but I'm, I won't repeat what's been said on Rights of Way. So I'm going to continue on the commons and just say that um, we talked about commons being privately owned, other people have rights there. I mean, it's so interesting, the public until recently did not have a right of access to commons, despite the name. Um, in 1925, we won the Law of Property Act, which gave people the right to walk and ride horses on certain commons in and around London. Um, what really frustrated us all was that commons were not recorded. So this is kind of a bit like rights of way. There were loads of, you know, none of it was recorded. There was no formal record of commons. So in 1965, we got the Commons Registration Act, whereby uh, people could register commons, but they had only three years in which to do this. And so they, we all rushed around the country, not me personally, we all rushed around the country trying to get the commons on the record. And so many were missed. Um, and then it was too late to record them. Um, we didn't get the general right of access until the year 2000, the Countryside and Rights of Way Act. So now we do have the right to walk on all commons where we didn't already have access. Another of our concerns about commons is that if people do put up a fence, you can't really rely on the commoners to do a, to do a Birkenstead and hire a trainload of navvies to go out and fell it. Um, the fact is people get away with it. Nobody has a duty to take action against unlawful works. Local authorities have a power. We, the public, have a power. The commoners have a power, but no one has a duty. So consequently, nothing happens. And it's really hard um, to get rid of unlawful works. The process for getting works authorized is to apply to the Secretary of State for Environment and get them consented. And we are consulted on all of those, but um, too many commons do have encroachments. And you find that people, you know, their back gardens, they just kind of pinch a bit in, they put up a fence, pinch a bit in. Um, so commons are constantly under threat, but they are so very special. And so they are an important type of land to know about because there's nothing like them anywhere else. England and Wales are unique. I'm going to move, am I okay? Yeah. Good. Um, swiftly on just to talk a little bit about village greens and other open spaces, because these are the places that are so close to people's homes and really matter um, to people sort of on a day-to-day -day basis. Village greens um, are, were defined um, quite lately actually as land where, um, local people have rights of recreation, uh, provided they've been doing it for 20 years without being stopped and without asking permission. There are parallels there with claiming public highways, but it's a right of recreation over a space, not just a track. And if you've been doing lawful sports and pastimes is the word, so any sort of recreation, um, you can claim a village green. Now they all had to be registered at the same time as the commons um, in 1965. Here's a village green, so you can see, being used in a traditional sense. 
Um, they all had to be registered. And if they weren't registered in that three year period, then they were lost just like everything else. But because the law says that if you have used the land for 20 years, you can claim it. Um, 20 years after the closing date on the Commons Act, which was the 1st of August 1990, you could start to claim again. You could start to build up your 20 years. And so people were doing that. And my society was very much encouraging them to do that. And uh, cases went to the court. And here's one in Sunningwell, Oxfordshire, which um, actually was a really important court case and a wonderful judgment, if you read it, um, by Lord Hoffman, where he set down all sorts of principles which relate to rights of way as well as village greens about what is the meaning of as of right, um, without being stopped, without asking permission, without seeing signs and doing it for 20 years. So people registered Greens after the 1990, they began to do it again. What happened was that um, once the Green was registered, the Victorian legislation kicked in, which said you cannot do anything on this Green, you cannot um, encroach on it, you cannot build on it. And so people began to think, uh, when they saw their open spaces under threat, they came to us and say, what can we do? And we said, well, if you've used it for 20 years, register it as a green, you'll stop the development. And so people were doing that because they loved their spaces. The government in 2013 introduced the Growth and Infrastructure Act, which said, if land is threatened with development, it is already too late to register it as a green, a kind of retrospective, super nasty piece of legislation, which put a stop to a load of registrations. So we have been frustrated in that. But the one thing that can be done is you can get a landowner who is a friendly landowner voluntarily to register a green. They don't have to have all the evidence of use. They can just register it. Um, here's one in um, North Yorkshire, which was voluntarily registered by the parish council. So we are going around to local uh, councils because they should be thinking of the public and saying, you've got an open space. Why not protect it forever from all those land grabbers and register it as a green? So we're really encouraging them to do that. Um, and that is happening to some extent. Um, and also it can be done by developers who are wanting to give something to the public in exchange, you know, for their nastiness, they want to give us something. So we say, well, you know, rather than just say green space, which later on you'll grab for something else, register it as a green, then it is protected forever. So a bit about today, um, the things that are going on today. First of all, common land, back to common land, the registers have it reopened to a limited extent and we are able to rescue some lost commons. And we were able to do that in seven counties in England up to the 31st of December, 2020. This is a small common that we did save and got back on the register, which got omitted in the 1965 Act. So that work continues. Um, we continue to be consulted on works on commons to, to protect them. Um, and then we look at all the opportunities um, for registering greens um, and also for registering local green space which can be done through the planning system when there's a neighborhood or local plan if you can get the authority to designate a local green space it gives it some protection so that again is another device that we're using but um, we do love the idea of the voluntary greens and we think that that really does have scope and that we all should be pressing our local councils and our local communities to think about land which they own and which they can protect forever um, as village greens so Sorry, that was a bit breathless. I've never done that in 15 minutes before. Um, I hope that was helpful and that I've given you some thoughts about different types of land uh, and the different ways that we can influence the outcome of what happens on that land. Thank you.